So thank you very much for inviting me. I, I have been um, um, asked to talk about Euroscepticism and populism in Greece. So I won't be talking about the media. I will just uh, use my next 15 minutes just to discuss what is the situation in Greece. So um, starting from um, the current economic crisis, we all know that uh, this is associated with high levels of recession uh, across all the pigs countries, right? I'm using the really nasty acronym, but uh, quite interesting as well. So Portugal, Italy, Ireland, uh, Greece and Spain. So all these countries are witnessing recession, uh, severe austerity measures, uh, high levels of unemployment, uh, declining standards and so on, which uh, have been met with um, wide uh, social uh, unrest, uh, disillusionment, strikes and so on. So um, it's not only the big countries, I mean there is a crisis across Europe and what we've seen is that increasingly this crisis is met with higher levels of uh, Euroscepticism uh, either from the left or from the right. Uh, classic examples are uh, the rise of UKIP uh, <laughs> recently in the United Kingdom or um, alternative for Germany, right? So a country that we would never have expected a Eurosceptic party to uh, contest in elections and not only contest, but actually do fairly well for the German standards and so on. However, going back to Greece, what I'm here to argue today is two things. Um, so I have two points and I will be repeating them throughout my presentation. Uh, despite the fact that we have a, a, a crisis-ridden country, the crisis has not resulted, in the case of Greece, in what we call hard Euroscepticism. So going back to Zoe's presentation, hard Euroscepticism is a wish for withdrawal from the EU, whereas soft Euroscepticism is a principled or contingent opposition to the European Union. So, Point one, the crisis has not resulted in wish for withdrawal. And point two, instead what the crisis has done is has served to expose um, the, uh, the available cultural <coughs> reservoir of the country. So a political country, a culture, I argue, which is one conducive to extremism, uh, lawlessness and defiance of authority, which explains why we have seen the rise of the extremes, both of the left, in the form of Syriza, or from of the right in the form of the Golden Dawn. Um, given uh, time restrictions, I will only uh, discuss the Golden Dawn today, but obviously I'm happy to take questions uh, about how this applies to the rise of the extremes generally. So, let me start with... Um, sorry. Giving you um, an overview of Euroscepticism or positions on European integration in Greece. This is a graph from um, the Eurobarometer survey. So it shows uh, positions on the question, um, do you think that your country's membership of the European community is um, a good thing, a bad thing, neither good nor bad or don't know? So what we see here, I mean, this is over time. It starts in 1981 when Greece entered the European Union. And it ends a little bit before, um, uh, in about 2012, I mean, you can't really see this, this is cut, but this ends in 2012. Um, what is the message here? The message is that Greece has an ambi Greeks, right, the people, have an ambivalent relationship uh, with the European Union. At the beginning, they started with very low support of the European community at the time, which um, in the end of the 80s, Changed, and we actually see a massive uh, support for the European project from uh, the end of the 80s until about a cut-off point, I would say, 2004. There have been times that Greece is the most <coughs> unified country of um, the, uh, the members of the club. Um, so we see a drop from the kind of mid-90s, like a fluctuation, and then I think the decline starts in 2004. What do we take home from here is that actually there has been decline in support of the EU, but this is not necessarily associated with the crisis. It has started earlier. Right? 2004 is an interesting time because obviously it coincides with uh, Eastern enlargement, right? So it's something for us to think about. Let's go to attitudes towards the single currency. Similar picture, and I think even more telling. 
the beginning of the 2000s, the blue line is support, right? And the red line is um, opposition. So the blue line is quite high. We are looking at times 70, uh, 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 more than 80% of support for the single currency. Again, mid 2000s, those two lines m meet one another. So people are pro and anti. And then from the crisis onwards, 2008 onwards, actually we see support for the euro. Right? Counterintuitive. You would expect in other countries that people will actually be against the eurozone. So my argument here is, of, of course, there is some level of what I call, or what we call in the literature, soft euroscepticism. But this is not necessarily translate, translated into wish for withdrawal. Why is this the case? There are many reasons, but I will um, talk about three. There are three reasons. First, how do the Greeks view the, their membership um, in the European Union and the Eurozone? Why did we enter the EU, in, or the European community at the time, in the first place? So it was part of uh, the center-right or right-wing government at the time, and Karaman Lissi's westernization agenda. What does this mean? Greece belongs to the West, as opposed to the East. Right? Let's not forget that Greece was part of the Ottoman Empire, and that has, not, um, um, has, has left a legacy, or what we call an underdog culture. So being part of the European community means that we are forward as opposed to backward, right? It's associated with higher living standards, democracy, and so on. Security reasons, right? We all know the problems that Greece is facing with its neighborhood um, and neighbor countries. So the EU can provide, or the Greeks believe that the EU may provide border security against neighbors, vis-a-vis -vis Turkey or even Macedonia, right? Issues of the name. They can use the EU as a leverage for that. Economic reasons, right? Utilitarian arguments. Let's not forget that Greece has been one of the main recipients of EU cohesion funds and other funds. And going back to my point, the fact that Greece are increasingly distrustful of the European Union from 2004 onwards does actually say something here, right? It's linked to that. So let me recap. There is a degree of um, soft Euroscepticism, but hard Euroscepticism is not really what characterizes uh, Greek society at the moment. Uh, parties are similarly kind of following the voters. Most parties are Europhile. Uh, apart from the Communist Party, which has always <coughs> been a hard Eurosceptic party, and even new parties, such as the Golden Dawn, that I will talk about in a minute, do not really talk about Europe. Right? They, they, Europe is not even an issue in the agenda. Even the issues of uh, the crisis, there is a generally accepted um, 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 a belief that they should be resolved within the context of the European framework. <coughs> But, right, no hard Euroscepticism, but we do see something else. So you, as you will see in this um, lovely picture, if you were to describe the people on this picture, you would probably say that, um, I don't know, they are a bunch of ha thugs, hooligans, and so on, right? They, they don't look very pleasant, and they are um, wearing army uniforms and so on. Um, yes, it's true. I would agree with you. They are probably... Um, quite violent and you know they're holding their arm up reminiscent of Nazi practices and so on but what I need to tell you is that these people are um, represent a party which is part of our parliament at the moment with 18 members so these are not ordinary thugs they are actually members that enjoy parliamentary immunity now the golden dawn um, Briefly, just to discuss their ideology, their extreme right um, ideology in um, the sense that they are nationalistic, they are authoritarian, and they are very populist as well. They do divide uh, the world into the corrupt elite versus the good people. Um, on top of that, what they do in their discourse is that they emphasize Nazi principles and an ethnic justification of nationalism. One is born Greek. One cannot become Greek, right? So what unites us is our race, our language, um, our color, and so on. They are anti-systemic. They argue that they are not associated with a corrupt um, establishment. However, they are very violent. 
and their members um, see themselves as street soldiers. What is very interesting, amongst other things, about the Golden Dawn is that they are, their um, voters' profile is mixed. Although they do have a lot of white, angry men, as we call them in Britain, right? People that are disillusioned, they're unemployed, they're young, they tend to be violent, they want to go to the streets and, and protest. They actually do see them as, do um, receive support from older people, and their support is, in, is, is on the rise among people that are even 65 plus. Um, men are overwhelmingly part of their membership, however, women do support them increasingly as well. So that goes back to what Zoe was saying, right? In Greece, there are a lot of left-wing authoritarians out there, and that may potentially explain why they're, um, or could be one explanation of why their voters have mixed profiles. They're not a specific segment of the population. Essentially, they come from across the spectrum, and some of them have been prior voters of left-wing parties. Now, how may we explain the success? Right? And this comes to me being a political scientist, trying to explain things. Um, if we look at um, the rise of extreme right-wing parties from the perspective of demand, right? we have um, high levels of unemployment, high levels of immigration, and so on. That could explain the rise of the Golden Dawn. However, there is a similar um, situation in Ireland, Spain, and Portugal, and there is no comparable success for an extreme right-wing party. Other type of explanations look at part supply, what we call supply, which is party system fragmentation. And one could argue, well, look, the party system was fragmented in the last elections, therefore it left political space for the Golden Dawn. Well, this is true. However, this has also happened in Ireland and in Spain. So if we see the Greek case in comparative perspective, these explanations are not enough. So, where my ideas come in is that we need to look at the actual parties as agents themselves, what we call discursive opportunity st structures, right? What are what uh, discursive choices they make? And we need to combine that with political culture and nationalism. Because the rhetoric that they will use, the discourse that these parties will use, depends upon the established political culture of, of a country. In a country like Greece, where nationalism is part of the established political culture, we have a problem. So, in that respect, I understand the crisis as the trigger, um, <coughs> excuse me, as the trigger that not in itself uh, provoked the rise of the radical right, right, but it did um, intensify the conditions favorable to the rise of the radical right. So these conditions are found in a political culture that is based on uh, polarization, defiance of authority, violence, and extremism. So if there is an existing culture that has extremist elements, then such parties have something to capitalize upon that already exists, which does not necessarily exist in other countries such as in other big countries, such as Ireland, Spain, and so on. There are other, this nationalism works differently in those countries. In Ireland, nationalism is directed against the British, whereas in Spain, nationalism is more diffused, and we have a lot of regionalism going on, so it's a more complicated picture. So, given that the existing culture is one of confrontation and polarization, the problem that we have in terms of policy implications is that instead of this party becoming moderate as part of its inclusion in the system now, what it happens in fact is that it has been able to some extent to radicalize the mainstream. So where do we see it? I mean, there are a number of implications and I could talk for a while, but I wouldn't want to talk for a while because it would be nice to have um, you know, a discussion. But I have a few um, bullet points here of events that have taken place that show how um, the Golden Hot Dawn has been able to uh, radicalize the mainstream. There have been issues of legitimization of violence, Golden Dawn MPs and supporters uh, being violent uh, publicly. <coughs> a classic example you may have been aware of is the incident where one Golden Dawn MP 
publicly slapped um, a communism bill on uh, national television, which really went unchecked. Other issues are issues of censorship. There have been um, an example is um, Corpus Christi. So this is a play uh, by Terence McNally, which depicts um, Jesus Christ as a homosexual. And um, on the premiere of the film, uh, Golden Dawn supporters were outside of the theater protesting. Uh, issue, they issued a death threat to um, the um, uh, actors. Uh, they, um, there were incidents of verbal abuse and so on, supported by the church, interestingly, but that's a different point. What happened in the end, instead of freedom of speech, right, you would have expected that uh, this um, <coughs> film would have gone on, especially in 2013, the film was withdrawn. So there are issues of censorship. Influence of policy agenda when it comes to immigration. Now that the, part, the members of the, of the party are part of the government, sorry, are, are part of the parliament, they can put forward various motions. One of them was a motion for um, a census information of all non-Greek children, reminiscent of Nazi practices. Um, other issues, right? Immigration policies. Partly as a response to the rising popularity of the Golden Dawn, there has been the operation, as we call it, Xenios Diaz, which is an operation targeting immigrants um, in, in a... In a fairly violent, the implementation of the policy has been really bad and it has been criticized by various um, human rights um, uh, organizations. So, I mean, these are still just examples. Today, the news, if you've monitored, they say that um, the Golden Dawn uh, is threatening to withdraw its 18 members from uh, the parliament as a result of the incident of a murder of a left-wing uh, activist last week, which, if it happens, it may well result in snap elections. So there is an issue of destabilization of the current um, government as well. And as I said, these are just simple, uh, uh, a few examples. I could be talking forever. So let me conclude and say, I've had two points. Um, Greeks are ambivalent towards uh, the European Union, what we see is, to some extent, soft Euroscepticism and a lot of populism, but not necessarily a wish for withdrawal. What we do see, however, is the rise of populism, both of the right and the left. Today I've looked at the rise of the right, and I have argued that the crisis is not enough in itself to explain the rise of the Golden Dawn, and that we need to look at this um, phenomenon through a political culture um, perspective. Now, what are the implications of something like that, especially if we compare Greece to Hungary that is experiencing a similar phenomenon, probably not so violent, but there are a, a number of similarities, right? What do we do? Do we tolerate the intolerance, or do we find ways to contain the intolerance? And my solution, or one thinking, is that we need to look at fostering civil society, this is why we're here today, and we need to look at um, changes in the education system. So, um, thank you very much. Thank you, Nicholas. Extremely interesting about Greece or against Greece, uh, but you didn't say anything about the second party or the left party, which by implication is different from the nationalist party. Where does that fit into your overall Greek political culture? Well, uh, thank you for uh, your presentations, but I have uh, a little bit puzzled because you mentioned earlier that there is no political uh, parties on European level, uh, no political uh, culture, all are nationalistic in a way, but I'm not sure you're right, because there is links. And I think uh, the question for me is whether you have European media scrutinizing this European level, uh, or connections uh, cross-border, because there are connections, and there are networks, and uh, we are all learning good and bad examples from each other, and I think um, the sadness is that it's not taken into the debate in the media. Thank you very much for your question. Um, it does fit from the perspective that um, 
let, let me start from the beginning. Um, the current crisis has resulted in, uh, resulted in the rise of the extremes. Golden Dawn is just one aspect of these extremes. And as you well um, mentioned, uh, Syriza, the radical left, is also on the rise, uh, contending to be part of the government if we have snap elections. Now, what unites the extreme left to the extreme right is this culture that is conducive to extremism, violence, lawlessness, and resistance. So, the ideologies are different, and the justification is different, but what unites them is violence. And Syriza has been associated with a number of violent attacks. The, the party not per se, basically, because they deny that, but their members are associated with violence, and the protests are never peaceful, that are um, um, uh, organized by these parties. So that fits within the idea of the culture of polarization, right? The problem in Greece is that actually the response against the Golden Dawn does not come from the political center. It comes from Syriza and the Communist Party. So instead of having a political center that will be able to contain these ideas, we have a response that only comes from, 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 from the far left, essentially, which actually kind of puts more seeds into the polarization problem. Thank you. Thank you.